We have an amazing opportunity tonight to really make good on the promise that this conference is indeed about narrative. And with us is the very distinguished Philip Lopate. He's an essayist, he's a poet, he's a novelist. His books include four personal essay collections. They are Bachelorhood, Against Joie de Vivre, Against Joie de Vivre, gee, that doesn't fit in with Il Dorito Pietri, but we'll try. Um, Portrait of My Body, Portrait Inside My Head, Waterfront and Urban Meditation, Notes on Sontag, To Show and Tell the Craft of Literary Nonfiction, being with Children, one of my husband's most favorite books. Um, excuse me, uh, lost my place. At the end of the day, which is poetry. He's also the editor of several anthologies, The Art of the Personal Essay, which my students have just read recently. Um, writing New York, American Moving Critics. He's the professor of writing at Columbia University where he directs the graduate nonfiction program. He's the recipient of a Guggenheim and a New York Public Library Fellowship, you lucky dog. I, have applied for the Scholars and Writers program endlessly with no success. I need to get you to write me a letter. Um, and two National Endowment for the Arts grants. Not one, but two. <laughs> He's also a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He was formerly the architecture critic for Seven Days, which I do remember well. He wrote on urban issues for Metropolis and Sight and served for many years on the Street Design Committee of the Municipal Art Society. And he always makes me feel a little less lonely and freakish. <laughs> Philip. Thanks very much, Susan. Um, when I told my wife that I was uh, going to be the keynote speaker at this design conference, she said, uh, why did they ask you? You don't know that much about design. <laughs> I said, well, um, I'm a distinguished writer. <laughs> that should be enough, right? <laughs> um, so I'm not, I'm not coming to you with that uh, kind of a speciality that you heard um, in Peter's talk, for instance. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm appearing before you as a writer talking about a uh, narrative of place and, and uh, I'm going to be talking for an hour, and um, and this talk is going to be a hodgepodge. Uh, I've been reading a lot of uh, Giacomo uh, Leopardi recently, and mm. they published his um, <laughs> his uh, notebooks, um, the, uh, which is called Zibaldoni, which essentially means hodgepodge. So that's my inspiration. Um, so the first part of this hodgepodge is um, I'm going to do a. a a quick romp around the narrative of place. Some of you may have be familiar with uh, uh, Godard's film, Band Apart, uh, where the three principals race through the Louvre in about one minute from room to room uh, in fast motion. And so I'm going to uh, race through uh, some of these uh, literary references that meant something to me, uh, obviously not complete. You can't, you can't possibly uh, uh, hit on all the important uh, uh, narratives of place, but um, they're, they're emblematic of, of a much wider group. So, for instance, um, there's, a, uh, there's a story by Gogol called Nevsky Prospect in which uh, he writes about all the different people who, who walk on Nevsky Avenue over the course of a of a day and how the population changes and the use changes. Um, there's an essay by Addison and Steele, uh, 24 Hours in London by Richard Steele, which does the same kind of thing, looks at, looks at, uh, at, at, an, at an area of London um, as, it, as it goes from morning uh, through afternoon and evening. And um, uh, many of you are probably familiar with uh, 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 Jane Jacobs' Death and Life of Great American Cities, where she has that famous passage about the choreography of, of the street, uh, in this case uh, an area of Greenwich Village where different people use it at, at different times. Um, there's this very kind of uh, familiar, almost trite notion of the street as a stage set. Uh, 
if you look at Palladio's uh, Teatro Olimpia, you'll see uh, that it, it, is, it is a kind of, um, th it's a street that, that is in fact a stage set. Um, there's uh, uh, the writing about the city as a mixture of, uh, uh, as a social mixture of high and low, uh, Dickens and Little Dorrit and so on. Um, and um, there are some wonderful novels by Zola which use one location, like um, his one about uh, department stores, The Lady's Delight. Um, his one about an apartment um, block called uh, Potluck or Potbury. Um, I always love the opening of uh, Balzac's Père Goriot where he, where he goes uh, through the boarding, boarding house room by room. Uh, and, uh, and all of Balzac, you know, like in Cousin Bet with the dinner parties, um, uh, has wonderful use of, uh, of uh, dramatic space. Um, 19th century novelists were particularly good at this. Perez Galdos uh, did wonderful things with Madrid, uh, such as in uh, Fortunata and Jacinta and the, the Torquemada novels. Um, and, uh, uh, and then there's the urban sketch, which is a, a, a form that um, uh, has been around for centuries. Uh, one of my favorite urban sketchers is uh, Joseph Roth and his, uh, his, his wonderful book, What I Saw, uh, which is uh, Sketches of Berlin. Uh, and Theodore Dreiser did it, Charles Lamb did it, um, you know, and I may do an anthology of just urban sketches at some point. Um, Whitman, of course, the inventory, going down into the street and listing everything he can see. Uh, the idea of this of the street as a kind of site of eros. Uh, Walter Benjamin talks a lot about this uh, in uh, his writings about Baudelaire, uh, uh, the poem To a Passerby, which is love at last sight in Walter Benjamin's <laughs> phrase. Uh, two people meeting, passing, I could have loved that person, you know. Okay, bye. <laughs> um, the Greek poet Kavafi uh, did, did amazing uh, poems uh, set in city sites. And um, I'm just going to read a short one called The Afternoon Sun because it's a, and for me, it's a perfect example of mise en scène in a poem. The Afternoon Sun. This room, how will I know it? Now they're renting it, and the one next to it, <coughs> as offices. The whole house has become an office building for agents, businessmen, companies. This room, how familiar it is. The couch was here, near the door. A Turkish carpet in front of it. Close by, the shelf with two yellow vases. On the right, no, opposite, a wardrobe with a mirror. In the middle, the table where he wrote, and the three big wicker chairs. Beside the window, the bed, where we made love so many times. They must still be around somewhere, those old things. Beside the window, the bed. The afternoon sun used to touch half of it, one afternoon at four o'clock, we separated for a week only, and then that week became forever. Um, there's also a lot of uh, writing about um, disappearances, things that used to be in the neighborhood that are no longer, uh, ghostly landscapes, uh, what Emil Fackelheim called the presence of an absence and referring to the Holocaust. Um, a way of looking at cities as this uh, continuous transformation. Um, and, and we see recently um, writers doing this, like Zabold, uh, like Claudio Magris, or like the English writer Ian Sinclair. Um, a very elegiac approach in a way. Um, I'm going to read uh, a piece that I wrote about my own uh, connection to New York City, narratively and otherwise. Uh, 
There was a book that came out recently called Goodbye to All That, in which they asked uh, writers to, who had left New York to explain, to write about their disenchantment. And the book sold a lot of copies, so then the editor decided to <laughs> do an anthology asking writers who did not leave New York. <laughs> so <laughs> I got called on. And, and, and so this piece is called To Live and Die in New York. And, and the epigram is from Leia Party. I told you I was reading a little Leia Party. He said, anyone who wishes or is forced to live in a certain town finds it expedient to believe it to be one of the best in all the habitable world, and he believes it to be such. OK. I am a native New Yorker, which means I was ruined in the crib for life elsewhere. The milk I drank from my mother's breast probably contained window soot or was diluted with traces of Rangold beer and egg creams. <laughs> we are all familiar with E.B. White's division of New Yorkers into three categories. The one who was born here and like myself supposedly, quote, takes the city for granted and accepts its size and its turbulence as natural and inevitable, end quote. The one who commutes into work each day and the third, who in E.B. White's words says, was born elsewhere and came to New York in quest of something, <coughs> end quote. It is from this last group of provincial questers that most of the disillusioned literary pieces about leaving New York are drawn. I find such essays from F. Scott Fitzgerald to John Cheever to Joan Didion however graceful stylistically, finally tedious and beside the point. They came here for a party and overstayed, poor dears. <laughs> <laughs> they viewed it in their 20s as a mecca for the young and then got older, tisk tisk. As a native New Yorker, which is to say an old soul who never believed in the glamour of youth, who has tried to live in other climes and come around to electing this city as my catafalque and final resting place, I have no choice but to embrace it with ardor. Disillusionment is not an option. I sometimes think back with incredulous wonder to the first half of the 20th century when New York was regarded as the capital of modernity, the futurist city par excellence. European writers like Paul Moran, Louis Ferdinand Céline, and Maxine Gorky would come here to gape at the frenzied, heartless, skyscraper dystopia in store for them like some robotic set out of Fritz Lang's Metropolis. I am permanently denied that culture shock because for me, New York is a worn and familiar old shoe, and I emphasize old. It seems increasingly like an elderly dowager wearing its architectural history of cast iron loft buildings and art deco cathedrals of commerce and Brooklyn brownstones and six story tenement Bronx walk ups and Greek revival museums and Rockefeller Center with imperturbable valetudinarian stubbornness. It has serious crack, cracks in its, in its infrastructure, certainly. But I say with Montaigne, quote, all that totters does not fall. The fabric of so great a body holds together by more than a single nail. It holds together even by its antiquity, like old buildings whose foundations have been worn away by age, without cement or mortar, which yet live and support themselves by their own weight." Unquote. Meanwhile, the future has moved off elsewhere. In place of the future is that recurring trope that New York is ripe for apocalypse. The destruction of New York by fire, Godzilla, flood, or nuclear weapon has been enacted countless times with grisly satisfaction on film, just as its demise has been predicted in 40-year cycles by pundits and social critics taking its pulse. It does not seem right to these experts that it can continue so recklessly reinventing itself, so it must be dying. But it is not. It survives warily and agnostically, as befits a colony that was started by the Dutch not for religious reasons, but simply to make money. There is a certain muscular set in the New Yorker's face 
that reveals the owner's tension, exasperation, wariness, elation, and expectation in easily legible layers. Or so I find it. When I lived in Houston or San Francisco and took public transportation there, I looked at the other bus riders and could not begin to imagine what they were thinking. But I have the sense, which could be completely misguided, that I can read the faces of New Yorkers, can easily slip into their streams of consciousness. This conviction, so important for a fiction writer, has nothing to do with any special attribute of New Yorkers. It simply means that I am a local here and would probably feel the same ease of identification with the populace's inner lives if I had been a native all my life of Cairo, Illinois, say. On the other hand, maybe it does have something to do with the specific character of New York because the greatest asset of this city is its plentiful public space. In its streets, parks, subways, even its semi-public spaces like schools, hospitals, libraries, restaurants, you feel you have the right to be there and to enjoy the company of strangers about whom you are free to speculate. You are equally free to wallow in loneliness, self-pity, and alienation. Though I myself never feel completely lonely or self-pitying if a swarm of people surrounds me. Like Whitman, I am energized by the crowd and momentarily a believer in democracy. We are often warned that our public space and urban characteristics are threatened, a phenomenon linked to what Richard Sennett di diagnosed as the fall of public man. The civic sense gives way supposedly to the corporate. The corporation builds a tower on Park Avenue and grudgingly sets beneath it a plaza which it polices to discourage the homeless and other undesirables. The expanding museum takes another nibble out of Central Park. The sports complex leaves only inches between itself and the waterfront fence for walkers. Suburban type malls with franchise stores replace mom and pop candy stores and so on. But what I see happening in New York over the long haul is more dialectical. A forfeiture of public space here, a restoration and expansion of it there. We get the new High Line and the Brooklyn Bridge Park and the Bronx River Park, the Louis Kahn designed FDR Memorial in Roosevelt Island, and the recreational plans for Governor's Island. The streets are reconfigured for pedestrians and bicycles. Car lanes are taken away. The habit of public space with its clashing urban textures and mingling of social classes is too deeply woven into New York to disappear. It is premature to mourn the loss of the soul of New York, another apocalyptic scenario promoted by those who attempted to quit it. Do I seem overly optimistic? No, it is simply that I have seen this city go through so many economic declines and rebounds, so many real estate booms and busts, so many community control decentralizations followed by municipal centralizations, so many alternations of left and right, so many crooked, crooked corrupt politicians of all stripes followed by so many investigations and cleanups that I have grown both, both cynically and idealistically confident that New York will somehow land on its feet. My favorite place to be in New York is the subway. I love to sit down, if I can find a seat, and look around and see the human hand that has been dealt me. <laughs> a mother and her squirming little boy to my right, a fat man sleeping across the aisle. Have you noticed how often people sleep in the subway? Even standing up they close their eyes, summoning dreams or just gray oblivion. Of course you could say that they close their eyes to ward off having to take in the strangers around them, which is a misanthropic interpretation. I prefer to think they feel so comfortable in the subway that they let themselves go, maybe even more so than they might in the privacy of their homes. Some contemporary poet should update Whitman's The Sleepers and write a great ode to the subway passengers rocking in the rickety arms of Morpheus and the MTA. <laughs> and then there are the subway readers of difficult books. I like to imagine that New Yorkers are more literate than the writers of other American metropolises. When I was a college student taking the subway all the way from Brooklyn to Columbia, I used to read fat Russian novels such as The Idiot or Anna Karenina with the covers conspicuously exposed. 
always hoping against hope that some pretty unattached woman nearby would be impressed. <laughs> and if she were the one reading a great classic, I would fantasize engaging her in a long conversation about what she thought of the book, whether she liked it or not, and then we would make love, get married, and have babies. <laughs> I still take tomes back and forth, most recently rereading The Magic Mountain on the subway, and try to peek at the titles of my fellow readers. Though now it doesn't matter whether the person besides me is a man or a woman, I simply want to know what educated young people are reading. If an attractive young woman is deep into a paperback by a hip, trendy writer such as R.M. or D.E., I'm immediately disheartened. What's the use, I think? I have never spotted anyone on the subway reading one of my books, though others have reported <laughs> such sightings to me. <laughs> but just today I saw a nice-looking young woman take out of her purse Primo Levi's Survival at Auschwitz and start to read with concentration, wrinkling her nose at what must have been a horrific passage. You can't get much better than Primo Levi. Come to think of it, once I saw a couple take out matching paperbacks of Plato's Republic, <laughs> which they were probably assigned for class, and start to imbibe the noble Athenian's philosophy. It was almost enough to balance out all the young people playing dumb games on their cell phones. What I like especially is when the subway rises above ground for a few stops, like the way it does on the F train at Smith 9th Street and 4th Avenue, and I can see the whole city spread out around me. The light is so beautiful suddenly. I remember reading a comment from Norman Mailer decades ago when he wrote for the Village Voice that the New York subways were a disgrace, like the black hole of Calcutta. First of all, I don't think Norman had ever been to Calcutta. <laughs> <laughs> so why was he defaming the place? And second of all, I just don't get it, the denigration of our magnificent mass transit. The subways, to my eyes, are a godsend. Efficient, they get me where I want to go pretty quickly. They provide entertainment, sometimes via musicians who perform at station platforms, sometimes through the singing panhandlers who traipse through the cars, and most important, they are a stay against solipsism, proof positive that I am not alone in the universe. It will be argued by proponents of other bergs that virtually everything I have spoken of in New York's favor can be found in other cities. I don't dispute that. New York does not have to be unique for me to love it. In truth, it is unique, partly because of its having this particular set of desirable attributes all in one place, and partly because of its piquant mixture of beauty and ugliness, which I choose to call reality. <laughs> when I am visiting other places around the world, they may strike me as lovelier, more orderly, more sensually alluring, what have you. But something is missing. I feel a thinning of the reality oxygen. When I am in New York, however, I feel up against the tragic and the sublime. The substance of life and all the stimulating potential for grimness, grandeur, and folly is conveyed to me by these very streets, these buildings, these surroundings. Is it simply grandiosity that fosters my identification with New York? You cannot separate me from it. The Brooklyn Bridge is my mother. The Empire State Building, my father. The ichor of my blood is from the Gowanus Canal. The lymph that flows in my veins is Hudson River drawn. My limbs and my head are the five burrows. Narrative, narratively speaking, there are the things that happen to New York and the things that happen to me and the two get tangled up in my mind. Here's a quote from Cicero. Such is the power of places to call up memories, and in this city, this is infinite, for wherever we walk, we set our foot on history. End quote. All of the city's catastrophic scars I seem to have registered in however vestigial a manner. The Dutch massacre of the Indians, the Revolutionary War conflagration that burned down half of Manhattan during the British Army's occupation, the typhus plague, the Civil War draft riots, the sinking of, of the German of the General Slocum Ferry, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory Fire. When the World Trade Towers fell on September 11th, I thought my city was under attack. It took me a while to register that all of America had been assaulted. The bad mayors and the good 
Jimmy Walker, LaGuardia, O'Dwyer, Impelitary, Wagner, Lindsay, Beam, Koch, Dinkins, Giuliani, Bloomberg, de Blasio, I took them all personally. The 1929 stock market crash was both a national event and a local one. My father was 19 when the stock market crashed and it branded him forever. He had been a budding newspaper man, but the papers he wrote for bankrupted, and so he went to work in a, fa in a factory and turned cautious, frightened to lose his job. Under his influence, I grew up similarly cautious, afraid to take out car loans or second mortgages. It works the other way as well. New York's excessive pride, chauvinism, provincialism, and superiority complex have left their special mark on me, and I have gone through life with an arrogance which is not the less irritating for being largely unconscious. I feel entitled to speak up, to have my say. That age of self-confidence that comes from being a native son of the center of the universe, the capital of the 20th century, it remains to be seen which metropolis will claim the 21st century, is balanced, I would hope, by the stoical resignation every New Yorker feels in the face of enormities we cannot control, of all that is outside our power. For as much as we are schooled in arrogance, we are also trained to feel powerless before the whims of chance and greed, the deities that run this city. Uh, so now I'm going to read something about another city, uh, Paris. Uh, something cr um, about the the surrealist walk. Um, the literary urban walk, it seems to me, has two tributary sources. The first is pastoral landscape poetry, an old vigorous tradition. Petrarch is sometimes credited with being the first to have treated walking through a landscape as a fit poetic subject, a pleasurable activity in and of itself, not merely a means of getting from one place to another. The English romantics, particularly Wordsworth and his long rural ambles, made walking a metaphor for being, while in prose, Hazlitt and Stevenson rhapsodized the joys of touring the country on foot. Now, the urban walk has its own rules. Uh, it is a curious phenomenon that the key, prose in, the key prose texts of the French Surrealists, Louis Aragon's Night Walker, Philippe Suppot's Last Nights of Paris, and André Breton's Nadja, all had walking in the city as their central action. They were all written in the 1920s in a spirit of friendly competition and shared ideas, so it is not surprising that there were overlaps, like the walk motif. Still, why should this particular group of writers who espouse the irrational, the dream, the power to shock, have been so drawn to such a mundane subject matter as taking a walk? And of course, taking a walk is a very, has no real plot, you know, and so it's a problem narratively. You have to find a plot in the walk. Several tentative answers come to mind. The Surrealists were committed to the idea of finding the miraculous in the everyday. They were fond of the notion of chance, which the street could offer in abundance, and they loved odd juxtapositions. So, intolerant of everything but the hallucinatory image, surrealism never produced a novel, nor for that matter did it forge the conceits of fiction into an anti-novel. With the walk, however, it found a convenient method of letting the mind wander, the better to intercept itself at every turn in a dialogue with pretexts that took the random shape of people, places, and things. I also think the transformation of Paris around that time from a gaslit city to an electrically illuminated one may have been a factor. The, f the Surrealists were very pro-electricity, as the number of light bulbs in their paintings attests. And the switch to this form of illumination must have excited them, just as it opened up whole new areas of the city for night walks. <laughs> Finally, the Surrealist peripatetic emphasis may come down to the fact that they were all restless young men with energy to burn who liked to stay up all night. Walking is free, and what more magnificent city to walk around than Paris? Um, I 
talk about Apollinaire the poet, but I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to go right into uh, Philippe Soupeau. Philippe Soupeau's Last Nights of Paris is told from the point of view of a nocturnal wanderer about whom we learn next to nothing, not his age, not his name, not his background, or his means of support. He seems, in fact, to have little personality beyond a capacity to make lyrical observations, some more interesting than others. Sipo rescues an unpromising premise, a long ramble trapped in the mind of a solitary character who seems to have both too little and too much ego by making the narrator shadow others. The walk gains a purpose by having the narrator keep one eye on the person he is stalking at the moment and the other on the city. For a while he tells a prostitute named Georgette, then a mysterious gang, then Georgette's crazy brother Octave who tries to burn down Paris. All this aimless tracking doesn't really add up to a plot. But then plot was neither the surrealist strong suit nor their main concern. Suppose narrative method is to play cat and mouse with the reader's expectations of plot by introducing suspenseful tonalities and edging the book slyly in the direction of a crime thriller, which it never quite becomes. An intriguing passage early on defines the outer limits of the narrator's true quest. Um, and this is the passage. He says, Thinking it over as we were walking with soft steps under the trees of the Champs Elysees, I seemed to catch a purpose, that of all the night prowlers of Paris. We were in search of a corpse. If all at once we had encountered a lifeless form lying prostrate on the pavement, bathed perhaps in his own blood, or propped against a wall, we should have come immediately to a halt, and that night would have ended. But it was that encounter, and that encounter only, which could have satisfied us. The walker then thus becomes a kind of detective, whose purpose is to catch a city unawares, making it yield its secrets. But to know a city's inviolable secrets, in supposed view, seems mainly to know its vices. Secrets are not the normal rhythms of daylight, the baby carriages in the park. Still less are they the adorable little donut bakery, the 10 best places to get onion rings after midnight <laughs> that our own consumerist media would have us believe. No, Supo offers up a world similar to Versailles' contemporaneous book of photographs, The Secrets of Paris, a tour of vice dens, gangsters, hangouts, and houses of ill fame. The quest for a corpse also brings to mind Ouija's night photography of crime scenes, murder victims on sidewalks towered over by feverish gawkers. All this night owl activity on the part of writers and photographers trying to learn the seamy underworld argo of this city may strike us now as poignantly dated. We don't want to do it anymore. We no longer share the romantic dictum that our artists must experience the dregs. Since art seems for the most part a peaceable vocation, practiced for the most part by the middle class or petite bourgeoisie, these artists who seek out hell seem protected visitors, tourists who are slumming. Walking does offer the vicarious opportunity to dip into other classes' lives. Is slumming the right word to apply to those hanging out above this station as well as below it? To the degree, to the degree that slumming implies a combination of envy and disdain temporarily held in abeyance, perhaps it is. Um, now, one of the things that Sopo does is he compares Paris to a woman, equating her with the prostitute Georgette on her rounds. In doing so, he follows the tradition of referring to Paris as a fickle, capricious, and unfaithful woman, like that famous music hall ballad by Padilla, uh, Sasse Paris, that exclaims, Paris was at one blonde. One finds it hard to imagine a song like that written about New York. <laughs> Manhattan, you're such a redhead. <laughs> Is it because we think of New York as hard and masculine? or asexual, neuter. In any case, Sipo keeps drawing his portrait of Georgette more and more abstractly until she merges with the spirit of Paris. Interesting that he picks a prostitute. It goes without saying that the literature of walking around has been until recently almost exclusively a masculine genre. The main reason is that women have not been made to feel the streets and other public spaces belong to them nearly as much as they do to men. The one exception to that rule would be the prostitute whose office is the sidewalk, and who is, is indeed called a streetwalker. Little wonder that the peripatetic writers of Paris should speak of prostitutes with such brotherly tenderness. They share the same beat. 
Um, okay, um, maybe that's enough of that. Um, I told you this was a hodgepodge. Um, I'm going to read um, some things that come from my books that are little descriptions that show how um, looking at the city, looking at the city around, around me kind of um, catapulted me into plots. Um, and a lot of my earlier books were taken during a period when, when I was a bachelor. A bachelor experiences a city, a single person, very differently from a married person with a family. Uh, so these are rather bacheloric. <laughs> I had found, this is from a novel called Confessions of Summer. I had found a new house, I had found a new home in the East 80s, a small studio apartment with two spacious windows that projected shifting bars of sunlight and a ballet studio floor of polished wood. I was tempted to put in an exercise bar. The place still smelled of fresh latex and varnish and had absolutely no furniture, the purity of a cell. White walls, newly laid parquet floor, the wood was still sticky with wax, which I discovered by walking around barefoot. At one end you saw windows and sunlight, which there really was quite a lot of, it being the top floor of a walk-up. At the door end of the white square had been attached a kitchenette like an extra squat dining car and then a squeeze-in bathroom. The building itself was five floors high and slender as a cigarette case. It had recently undergone renovation, the lobby done up with turquoise mosaics, and the interior shell subdivided and T-squared into skin-tight efficiency studios. The efficiency had been all for the owner, not the tenants. But the selling point in any case was the neighborhood, which I knew nothing about. I had wanted to get away from the Upper West Side with its choked air of homey, dingy responsibility and complacent liberal intellectualism, and more to the point where every restaurant was ruined for me by memories of botched love relationships. <laughs> the East Side seemed frivolous as a poodle in comparison. I moved on a Saturday, and when, and when my friend and I were finished and he had left, I wanted to go out at once. My explorations took me past chalky luxury apartment towers, Mirage New, with their self-important fountains and elaborate underground garage entrances, past a discotheque named Barney Googles with artificial grass carpeting at sidewalk. The vulgarity excited me, as vulgarity often does. French bakeries on virtually every block proclaimed a bonbon of a neighborhood where I might walk for miles without encountering another dyspeptic bookworm, bookworm another image of myself. I looked through the glassed-in windows of bistros that offered special Sunday brunches of eggs benedict and sangria, at the clients leaning their foreheads toward each other like penguins, the men in blazers and turtleneck sweaters, the women with casserole shirts and decorative scarves. It was a young or middle-aged crowd, the Epicurean avant-garde of the bourgeoisie, who took very seriously their weekend relaxations, their tennis, their sex, their coffee makers, their rock records, their Beaujolais by the case. I was both repelled by them and anxious to join them. The neighborhood was spoken of as a kind of dude ranch for studesses and kindergarten teachers on the make. Singles territory. Very well then, that's what I was, and the sooner I faced up to it, the better. My favorite walk was down by the river near the mayor's house, Gracie Mansion. I would walk out left to Queens to a factory across the water with a scarlet ne neon sign which kept blinking alternately, Pearl Wick Hampers, Bathroom Hampers, <laughs> Pearl Wick Hampers, <laughs> Bathroom Hampers. It was as though God were whispering something in my ear. <laughs> Downriver were the three Con Edison uh, uh, smokestacks, a comforting triptych painted white, red, and gray with their spires narrowing to a flat, pudgy top. Aside from being ugly, they had the quaint honesty of antique industrial totem totemism, iron and foundry works of the 19th century, innocence itself, as they stood in the blue-gray light surrounded by storm clouds that had either, that had earlier unleashed rains or were just about to. Across the river to the left was an old piano factory, grimy sooted but with a green cupola surprisingly like Paris. 
Sometimes a tugboat would start out from the basin a few blocks north, thoughtfully smoking its pipe, would round the bend, pulling three barges capped with dirt like funeral mounds trapped end to end, and then there was nothing else to do but follow it for as long as it passed. Its white spume started the green waves slapping against Manhattan Island, and leaning over, one could see jimmied loose pads of black tar floating along. I preferred the East River to the Hudson. The East River was a real city river. It seemed more grittily human, like Broadway, cutting a channel between concrete clab shores. Um, okay, that's a description that uh, is in between the story of a love triangle. Um, and here's something about Brooklyn uh, that I wrote. This is from an essay about Brooklyn. I grew up in Brooklyn, my family having resided just above the poverty line in the ghettos of Williamsburg and Fort Greene before clawing their way up the lower middle class ladder to Flatbush. When I went off to college in Manhattan, I vowed never to look back. Manhattan was the city, the party, heaven and hell. When out of state friends who didn't know any better settled in Brooklyn, championing its civility and low key grace I took in the fact that they had more space and prettier apartments than I, but did not envy them. For me, the borough carried a stigma. Brooklyn was the primeval ooze out of which I had crawled in order to make something of myself, and a move back would be a defeat, a regression to childhood and family entrapment. The rest of my family, including my parents, followed me in time to Manhattan, except for my younger sister Joan, who chose to live on Chiva Place a cul-de-sac in the backwaters of Cobble Hill. Each time I took the F train to visit my sister, I pitied her for still living in Brooklyn. The wheel turns. I now live seven blocks from her old address. <laughs> Just as I had expressed unconscious resistance to trekking to Brooklyn by never memorizing the directions there, asking her anew each time, so now do my Manhattan friends toy the same with me. It is, it is as if they secretly hope to erode my patience with directional amnesia until in the midst of repeating these tedious instructions, I will break down and say, oh, all right, let's meet in the city. <laughs> On the face of it, the barrier between the two boroughs should not be so great. After all, it is quicker to hop from Wall Street across the river to Brooklyn Heights than to traverse the island all the way to northernmost Manhattan. Yet I have known many Bro Manhattanites who never set foot in Brooklyn. I remember once asking a highly cultivated elderly couple if they might want to join me and my wife to hear Baroque opera at BAM. I was told, my husband and I don't go to Brooklyn. <laughs> These were world travelers who lived half a year in Capri. <laughs> <laughs> Even the more intrepid downtown Manhattan types who in the 1980s started going to BAM for its avant-garde performances would often travel in packs, emerging from the subway with looks of suppressed terror and cling to their chums like rope-climbing mountaineers until they had reached the safety of the Brooklyn Academy. <laughs> As it happens, the area around BAM is choppy and unprepossessing, usually under construction or partly boarded up, a classic transitional zone caught between commercial, residential, and traffic conduit. I do not blame Manhattanites for being afraid to venture left or right into unknown streets, but there is more to their hesitation than fear of muggers there is also profound confusion at the vagueness of Brooklyn's urban design. In contrast to the clear insular certitude of the Manhattan grid, Brooklyn's vaster landmass is more like the continental United States in its potential for inspiring agoraphobia. Manhattan's grid is like a tall menu offering a hierarchical suite of neighborhoods. The merest change in signage, street lamp, or fenestration signals to the trained local eye a world of information about income and class. Brooklyn is no less class bound, but its status cues are harder to read, especially for the Manhattanite who is so used to precisely calibrated progressions of luxury and distress. <laughs> then too, the arrival in Brooklyn brings with it a drop in sophistication and tension. Manhattanites often equate the two that registers immediately in the body. I have experienced it myself as a decompression, a weight lifting from my shoulders. Entering the lower rise streetscape 
compared to that of Manhattan is like going from a tense verticality to a semi-prone position. The unstiffening is one of the delights of living in Brooklyn, but for the casual day tripper it can be, it can be alarming, like the woozy onset of a tranquilizer. <laughs> the Manhattanite has learned to convert wariness into a muscle, which twitches unhappily when not stimulated. The Brooklynite has adapted to greater quantities of boredom and is less afraid of it. <laughs> Everything on the Brooklyn side of the bridge is more casual. You see fewer fashion statements. Passers-by seem like ordinary people rather than out-of-work actors projecting a cameo-worthy intensity. Even the slackers in Brooklyn have less fiercely ideological anti-ambition than Manhattan dropouts. Brooklyn coffee houses appear to be furnished with throwaways from the owner's aunt's living room. There is, in short, a touch of the amateur, voluntary, homemade about the place. I remember when my wife became pregnant and we began looking for larger living space than our one-bedroom, fifth-floor walk-up in the West Village. I was determined not to leave Manhattan, but we looked uptown and down and grew fed up with the overpriced, jerry-built crawl spaces pretending to be duplexes, the apartments that were darker than a jail cell. I had somehow forgotten to bank $5 million to purchase a townhouse in the village. <laughs> so we began reluctantly to consider buying a house in Brooklyn. On our second day of looking in that borough, we fell in love with a Carroll Gardens brownstone and made an offer which was accepted. That night we had second thoughts stealing peaks up and down the nearly deserted Court Street on a Saturday night. My stomach the gut of a Manhattanite attuned to urban excitement felt queasily hollow. Were the quiet streets an omen of our soon-to-be-dulled existence? Were we about to make a huge mistake? Fifteen years later, we have more than adjusted while the surrounding neighborhood is accommodated by growing livelier and hipper. We love our house, our block, and the borough of Brooklyn. Perhaps like the pod people in Invasion of the Body Snatchers, we have simply been taken over by some Gowanus legume that insidiously hypnotizes us to accept a blander life. All I know is that when I go into Manhattan, which I do on the average of three times a week, I enjoy the city, but I do not miss living there. Yet I realize I may never be whole. I have been both Manhattanite and Brooklynite. I have identified with the imperial contempt of the former and the complacent inferiority complex of the latter. I have sampled the Champagne and the Ovaltine and will forever be split. <laughs> Thank you. Um, one of the things that happens when you're walking around and, and, and writing about places is that you try to make something out of nothing. You look at something and, and you see if you can squeeze a narrative out of it. Um, and I do that when I write, when I write diary entries. So I'm going to read you one of those diary entries um, uh, that comes from Walking the Streets. And I had mentioned Walter Benjamin, and in a way, this was inspired by um, his, his compilation, One Way Street, where he puts in a lot of, which is a hodgepodge, essentially. <laughs> Another great hodgepodge. Please post no bills, stenciled in white against a green metal gate in Chelsea. The please is a tip-off that the owner lacks authority to enforce his request. <laughs> and in fact, next to these words, and all along the block, are dozens of posters, some repeated four times, like postage stamps. Not surprising that displayers would want to increase their chances, gashed, defaced, papered over, often, or often before the week is out, city wall posters are more transient than cherry blossoms. Indeed, the, aesthet the aesthetic of partially torn posters, the top image penetrating those beneath like a lap dissolve, has so often been celebrated by photographers, Aaron Siskine, Harry Callahan, or painters, Kurt Schwitters, uh, Tapias, that has become a cliche for the archeological layering of disposable, fragmented modern life. Perhaps, too, visual artists are drawn to this maimed image by a kind of self-pitying identification. For all its fragility, however, there is something raffishly outlaw about the medium. One is never sure whether the posters have the right to inhabit their wall or are informational squatters. 
Their legally marginal status is characteristic of the contested nature of public space in the city. Is it all right to sit in the corporate plaza on the concrete lip of a tree pot? The pedestrian gets used to the idea of perching transitionally like a pigeon, ready to be shooed off. <laughs> Those who put up wall posters are fly-by-nights going into operation after dark. In 16th century France, the explosion of printing prompted Francois I to issue a ban against wall placards. He wanted to control the information to the townspeople, but for all his royal power, did not succeed. Parisians still regard putting up wall posters as their political right. Défense d'affiché has a more somber, authoritarian sound to it than post no bills, and is resisted accordingly even when the poster is only a product ad. In New York, what tends to be advertised are not consumer goods, but entertainments, pop concerts, dance troupes, off-Broadway plays, movies of an invariably marginal nature, like horror, softcore, or indie sleepers, foreign art films, never blockbusters, those blessed with huge advertising budgets wouldn't stoop to such a low-rent medium. In the midst of these super graphics for passing spectacles, one occasionally encounters a political broadside. I remember those put out by a group called the Revolutionary Communist Party using a one-page newspaper format with screaming headlines that culminated in exclamation points and below, column after column of small type. They were obviously modeled on the Chinese Cultural Revolution, but whereas in Beijing a single wall poster might have signaled a change in governmental policy, here they manifested the lunatic fringe isolation of those radical left groups splintered after 1968. Their black and white fury was like a soot-specked snowball, which hurled against the wall, desperately attempts to hold its crystalline purity against a sunny day. There was something touching about the futility of these broadsides as instruments of persuasion, not least because of their old-fashioned belief in the power of words. Their look was so unesthetic as to exert a perverse pull. Perhaps their one true subversive aspect was to disdain the quintessentially now art of graphic design. Paragraph was crammed giddily atop paragraph in an effort to squeeze a political education into a single page. On a cold night, a stroller would risk frostbite by accepting the challenge of such a poster. <laughs> but even on a warm night, it was hard to imagine anyone standing before one of these broadsides for the 25-odd minutes it would take to read every word not only because the language was so repetitiously shrill, but because the typeface became so tiny and blurred as though a speaker expecting to be misunderstood dropped his voice to a mumble. <laughs> the author of these wall newspapers would seem to have been only partly trying to communicate with the public in earnest. By setting up a labyrinthine course of dense columns which only the most dedicated could follow, did not the party hope to ensnare the proverbial one in a thousand like a spiritual test to find the deserving acolyte? Or was it a matter of anticipating rejection and demonstrating in advance an indifference to popular reaction? <laughs> Speaking directly to history in the form of the victorious working class who would emerge someday and applaud the proper line having been taken. Headline, only genuine communists will tell you the truth and not lie to you. Since so many of the broadsides unmasked a conspiracy, the murder of kickback, kickboxer Bruce Lee, the persecution of Brother Bob Avakian, the sinister FBI plot behind the Korean jetliner crash, the collusion of Rockefeller and British royals in the drug trade, and so on, it was tempting to see the crammed, confusing layout as a visual analog of paranoia. The paranoid discourse often suffers from lagaria, a kind of non-stop talk to ward off enemy signals jamming the mental airwaves. Like those madmen who pick at the television studios with leaflets about how the networks have stolen their life stories to make all the popular sitcoms and police shows of the day. In a sense, they're right. It would seem the Revolutionary Communist Party wall posters are addressed precisely to people of my ilk, 
wishy-washy left liberals. The headlines deliberately intended to irritate us by crossing the line of acceptable caution. Is the motive to push someone like me into radical action or more likely to provoke me into showing my true colors as a reactionary? I will give an example of a headline I saw on one of these wallpapers which, so to speak, separates the radicals from the liberals. <coughs> Genuine communists are the only ones qualified to lead the struggle against anti-Semitism. Proceeding from a strict Leninist analysis, this idea may have a certain logic. However, as a Jew, I am so revolted by the suggestion that Jews may not defend themselves against anti-Semitic attacks, but must wait for their communist allies to show them the way, <laughs> and by the implied association of Judaism with usury and, cap and capitalism, which might render the defense against anti-Semitism tainted, that I began to sputter with rage. At the bottom of this broadside, another headline declares, fight anti-Jewish attacks by organizing the working class to take state power worldwide. This idea rather amuses me. It would seem on the face of it a monumentally difficult as well as indirect approach, but perhaps not. I am skeptical that the worldwide triumph of the proletariat would necessarily put an end to anti-Semitism. Which would be harder, getting rid of anti-Semitism in this world or organizing the working class to take power? Both are beyond the capacities of this humble Jew. I was always amazed when I met in the old days a radical who would tell me to organize, inserting the word into the conversation with fetishistic confidence. I would not have presumed to go to the working class and organize it. When I encounter such terminology again on a wall poster, I feel both fond and embarrassed. Fond as if running into a classmate from my youth, and embarrassed as at an uncle who is talking too loudly and inappropriately using an old dead language in front of strangers. Um, let me see what time it is. I think time's up. Yes. Um, any questions, comments? <laughs> I used to um, study with Maya Shapiro, and he, he was a short man, and he would bring a stack of books that were taller than he was. Um, <laughs> so um, this is my security blanket that I brought with me. Well, Thank you. Yes. Help, helping us think the city from another perspective is always well. The idea, the idea of why the last piece was actually about design, by the way. You yeah. know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but I think design today has moved on to the observations, to the subway car. Uh -huh. to the, you know, and the, ten the tentativeness <coughs> about organizing that you just talked about. Uh -huh. I mean, I remember being in high in college and during the anti-war protest yes. and writing a letter to the editor of the Verona Cedar Grove Times. Verona Cedar Grove Times was, it's 20 miles away where I grew up, and it was like, I knew that's what I should do. Talk to the, not talk to my peers, talk to somebody. Oh, but okay. it felt yeah. so... Belong. I mean, I did it, and I still have the clipping. You were a good girl. Well, I was a good girl, yeah. And I, I mean, I thought, well, for what it's worth, I'll try it. But the idea of organizing others, I mean, it's a, it's a real, but how do we affect change? That, that's ultimately, was that with some humility? I'm not offering any suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Um, can you just sort of speak to, I don't know what you call it, but it's like the, the it's like the view of the city that's through the street, you know? It's yeah. like this, it's, I don't know, I just, I, all of my Instagram pictures seem to be of like streets, little streets with the buildings and the lights and the way that the light is kind of captured. Right. It's like its own, I don't know. I, I don't mean, know. I'm fascinated, I'm fascinated with, when I think of New York, I think of streets. It's the first word that comes into my mind. And, and uh, you know, that wouldn't be true of Los Angeles, let's say, you know. Um, and I think that, uh, that, that, this, that the city is, um, is generous in that you can you can land there and see it's not covert it's overt you're you're seeing what what even people have been here uh, decades are seeing you know it's all out there and that in in that sense it is a theater you know um, and I also I like the I like the basic uh, design of New York streets which was like you know that it was built building by building one thing after another and so you'd have a tall building a short building you know and 
you know, before you had these uh, one one building versus uh, as one block, when you had the kind of strips like, like the block uh, between 7th and 8th Avenue on 42nd Street is probably has about 25 buildings in it, you know. Um, uh, you know, so, and I, and, I, and I love the grid, you know, I think, you know, like the grid is often attacked as being, you know, um, an instrument of capitalist speculation, but actually I think it's a, it's a wonderful engine, you know. Um, and then you have those streets that cross the grid, like a Broadway, you know, that makes something triangular. Um, so, um, I, I mean, I, 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 just, I just feel like, um, it's funny to say, but I feel safe in the streets, you know. Um, and there is this drama, you know. Uh, you, and, and when you feel all, all fed up with yourself, you go out into the street, you know, and there's always faces to look at. And for me, that's, that, that's a great power, you know. Yes? Uh, do you think that within the context of a design um, symposium, do you think that a writer uh, contributes something unique to this discussion about a city? Well, I mean, what, what I was hoping to do, I mean, the answer to that is probably not, but what, what I was hoping to do is, uh, <laughs> is um, to, to show the way narrative can, can germinate from almost anything. You know, and uh, and you know, you 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 grow up in a certain a certain area. You know, um, I mean, I'm just gonna um, I'm just gonna read one little paragraph to give you an example um, of because uh, I grew up in, in in Williamsburg, and and this is again like a kind of um, the elevated train was very significant for me. We lived on the top floor of a five-story tenement in Williamsburg, facing the BMT elevated train, or as everyone called it, the L. Our floors and windows would vibrate from the L, which shook the house like a giant, roaring as his eyes were being poked out. When we went down into the street, we played on a checkerboard of sunspots and shadows, which rhymed the railroad ties above our heads. Even the brightest summer day could not lift the darkness and burnt rubber smell of our street. I would hold my breath when I passed under the L's long shadow. It was a spinal column of my childhood, both oppressor and liberator, the monster who had taken away all our daylight, but on whose back alone one could ride out of the neighborhood into the big, broad world. So, you know, it's all, it's all design in a way. You know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, uh, you know, it's um, your environment and the way you're impacted by your environment. Can't answer it any other way. That's a, that's a wonderful answer. And thank you, Philip. Thank you all.